Welcome back. In this video, we're looking at how TCP sessions can be secured using the TLS protocol, which is the underlying security mechanism used by applications such as HTTPS. Let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we'll be looking at securing TCP connections using TLS, or transport layer security. This is the mechanism used to provide the HTTPS, or secure HTTP service for websites. So TLS, because it supports HTTPS, is probably the most widely used security protocol that we'll encounter. While early on it was primarily used for things like e-commerce sites or web email, it's become increasingly widely deployed to where the majority of websites use HTTPS and it's supported by all browsers. The service provides confidentiality using symmetric encryption, integrity via cryptographic hashing, as well as authentication via public key cryptography. So it's combining the elements that we saw previously, just like we saw with the email example. You may also have heard the term SSL or SSL 2.0, and that was an earlier protocol providing the same service, which has been deprecated and replaced with TLS. So it's important to note that even though SSL got up to higher version numbers, you might've seen SSL 2.0, for example, TLS 1.3, the current version, is the technologically more advanced protocol and replaces SSL. So as we've done with other protocols in the course, we're gonna build up from basic elements and see what's needed to achieve this transport layer security. So we'll call our protocol TTLS or toy TLS, and it's gonna have a number of elements. One is the handshake using certificates, private keys, and so forth. We'll have key derivation, data transfer, and then connection closure. In a time sequence diagram, we can overlay this on a TCP exchange. So we see that the TCP connection must be established first with the SYN and the SYNAC, and then we can send over our TTLS hello, retrieve the public key certificate, and use that public key to encrypt a master secret key, so the shared secret. And we're going a step beyond what we've seen so far in that the master secret key is going to be used to generate additional session keys for the TLS session. The one downside we see here is that we've now introduced an additional round trip time before data can be exchanged. So before we already had the overhead of the TCP session needing to do a handshake, but now we've added an additional handshake and it can't happen until the TCP handshake is completed. So it adds additional time before the connection can begin. So just for reference, it's considered bad to use the same key for more than one cryptographic function. And so in this example, we need to have different keys for message authentication and for encryption. So we end up needing four keys. Encryption key for the data sent from the client to the server, the message authentication key for data sent from the client to the server, and then we have a different encryption key for data sent to the server to the client, and a different message authentication key for data sent from the server to the client. All of these keys will be derived from the key derivation function, or KDF. This is based on the master secret. So now we have a technical consideration. TCP provides a byte stream abstraction. So it's just a sequence of bytes going from one end of the connection to another. So the question is then, do we want to wait for that entire stream to be finished before we can decrypt it and provide the authentication or something else? And so in this example, we are going to break the stream into a series of records or blocks. There will be a known chunk size of data that's sent, and then the record will carry along the message authentication code created using the master secret. And so the receiver can be processing these records as they arrive, instead of waiting for the entire stream to be over. Each record is encrypted using the symmetric key and then passed to TCP. So how could this be attacked? Well, we have the issue of reordering. So because the TCP header is not protected by this mechanism, a man in the middle could mess with the TCP header, reorder the, the data contents inside those TCP packets, and then send them on. We could also be subject to a replay attack, where the man in the middle saves the encrypted information and is able to send it later, as we saw earlier with the authentication attacks. So to protect against these, we're going to have sequence numbers within TLS, so encrypted sequence numbers, and a nonce that won't be reused in later connections. We also mentioned that we were going to have a connection closing procedure. So a potential attack is that the attacker might truncate the connection by forging the TCP connection close segment. Recall that TCP flags control when the session is closed. And again, that's not protected by this encryption. So the solution to this is to introduce record types and have a particular type for closure 
and that type will be inside the encryption and so not subject to forgery by the attacker. The TLS protocol provides an API for applications to interface with. So from the perspective of HTTP, the original version of HTTP ran over TCP directly with no encryption, whereas HTTP2 is able to use the TLS interface. If you've also heard of HTTP3, that's a slimmed down version of HTTP2 running over QUIC. And we note that QUIC runs over UDP. So there's significant changes there where the QUIC protocol takes on the roles of reordering and flow control and congestion control and runs that all over UDP instead of allowing TCP to perform those functions. So for this discussion, we're looking at HTTP running over TLS, which in turn runs over TCP over IP. So TLS and the version number, in this case 1.3, identify what we call a cipher suite or a particular set of mechanisms for key exchange and encryption. And in fact, it has multiple options for some of these functions, such that during the handshake, the two ends need to negotiate which schemes are going to be used for generating keys and exchanging them and so forth. You note that compared to 1.2, there are fewer options within the Cypher suite. And for example, RSA has been removed as an option for key exchange, and only Diffie-Hellman is supported. It then uses AES for encryption and authentication. It then uses SHA-256 as its cryptographic hash function. So here we have our TLS handshake, and the client indicates in its packet which Cypher suites it supports, as well as the parameters for the Diffie-Hellman key agreement. The server then responds back with a selected Cypher suite out of the available options that the client supports, confirms the key agreement protocol parameters, as well as its signed certificate. The client then checks the service certificate by which we mean it decrypts it using the certificate authority's public key. And as long as that checks out, it can then generate the master secret key and begin making application requests. Now there's also the case where we could have a zero round trip time handshake. And this is possible if the client is resuming an earlier connection between the client and the server. So it already has some pre-established information. And so it's able to encrypt application data using the master secret from the previous connection. However, this would be vulnerable to replay attacks, so we have to be careful with where it's allowed to be used. So that wraps up our discussion of TLS and HTTPS. In the next video, we'll look at IPsec, which we can think of as IP layer security, whereas what we were just looking at was transport layer security. See you in the next one. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.